I think it absolute dogs of you from, uh, from the players um, for having weird tastes. Not just in music, in absolutely everything. Um, I came from, from a very different background from a lot of the players. Um, I come from education and different areas that, you know, the lads had come and just wanted to be footballers. I come from a different direction. Um, and I thought I was a lucky one. Uh, and when they called me weirdo, I mean, Colin Pace always called me weirdo. In a friendly way, we were great friends. They would wind me up about it. But A, I was confident enough to take it and smiled at it and laughed at it. But B, I hope it wasn't arrogance. But I thought they were all wrong and I was right to get it. The thing I liked about maybe The Fall, maybe one or two of the other bands that I used to listen to, particularly when I played football, is when the rest of the team were playing, you know, Simply Red or Fifth Rare or something very middle of the road and nice or even Wham at the time. I'd come in with my fall CD, no it wasn't CD, it was before that, it was a tape to put in the bus. I'll be honest with you, they didn't last long. They usually get chucked out the window. Um, but I just wanted to play it. And some of the guys actually quite liked the odd track. But it was a big thing about the fall and a lot of bands at the time. It was my escape. Football can kind of take over you a little bit. Football can, it's almost, you, you can't get out of it. If every moment your mind of every day is consuming you because football is like that. I needed something to take me out of it. And kind of my other massive passion was going to see bands. So if you go to see someone like The Fall or Joy Division as a big fan or whoever at the time, for that 90 minutes or whatever it was, or The Fall something 25 minutes, you forgot about everything. It completely wiped your brain. And quite often, I won't up for this now, I'd go to a gig on a Friday night before I started the game. There was no way I was going to get recognised because football fans of my team, or fans of Chelsea at the time, not that many were going to these gigs. And the ones that were going weren't going to grasp me up to the manager anyway. But I didn't drink a lot and I made sure I was very professional about it. I thought it was a perfect way to relax before a game of football. Others, well, others would not necessarily agree with that. Going to see, as I said, the Jesus and Mary Chain and jumping up and down, punk, sort of rock kind of, you know, modern punk rock kind of thing. You say, maybe not the right thing, but for me, it was the best way to relax. And uh, oddly enough, when I came back in the next day, my brain was wiped, ready for a game of football and felt absolutely brilliant. A number of the guys I used to hang about with were, were not footballers, in fact, I didn't actually hang about with many footballers. Most of my mates were um, musicians. Um, by the time I, looked, I left Chelsea, I'd actually been to a lot of bands down here, and one of them was the Smiths. Um, but I went to Everton, when I got to Everton, I actually met up with the first time. An old mate of mine called Vinnie Riley, who used to be with uh, Black Culture at Colm. This all gets very complicated, you need to bring the factory records to get it all. But uh, invited me around to Moses house and uh, we went around one night and it was the most phenomenal evening. Um, I got an absolute brilliant with him. I thought it was a riot. Um, some people are only taken in two ways. They're so famous that they are either adored like royalty, like gods, like he is with a lot of people. But to be fair, the rest of the people hate him. <laughs> like he's a complete and utter idiot. Um, funnily enough, I was right in the middle. I thought it was all right. I quite liked him and treated him normally. And, and when he's he treated normally as a really different kind of guy. Uh, but well, what a great night we had. And I said to him at one point, show me around your house. And he goes, I'm not doing that right. Oh, don't be silly, show me your house. So he showed me around his house and it was extraordinary. We come to one room and it was the greatest line. What a cool line he came up with. He said, in this room, have a look. Looked all white except for one thing. And it was a baby grand piano. To which Vinnie, my friend, who was a great guitarist and a great pianist said, Oh, I didn't know you could play. To which Moe said, I can't. I bought it for us for tonight. So <laughs> Vinny sat down at this baby grand piano with Moe's mumbling and singing away and I'm sitting in the background going, what did I tell the lads at training tomorrow? <laughs> it was extraordinary. The one guy who I didn't tell was um, Norman Whiteside who was supposed to come with us. Norman liked a wee drink and he was quite famous for it. So I dumped him on the way over. Problem is, I'd given him the address. Two hours after I'd left, Norman turned up at Morrissey's door, in fact outside the door, and started climbing over the railing shouting, Buddy, wee man, where are you? And uh, I think it was phoned the police and Norman had to run away. The madness of the evening was fantastic, but oddly enough, um, I found him actually a pretty normal guy. I did, and many people asked me about this, ask to get off at halftime in a Chelsea game so I could go to see a band. Yes, this is absolutely true, and it was a cock to twins who I was a big fan of at the time. I was just about to sign a new contract for Chelsea and uh, I said to the manager, we've got a game next Tuesday, uh, can I leave at half time? <laughs> can I see a gig? Uh, he got the shock of his life but he wanted me to sign. Now I will be 
honest with you, if it had been a big game, a cup game or a league game, I wouldn't have done it, right? I'd be, I'm, that, I'm professional enough to have that attitude, but it was a pre-season game that I was in good nick and I knew I'd probably done enough. Um, so I did, I went off at half time and put my clothes on over my Chelsea kit, put a pair of trainers on and got straight in it one day and I went to see this gig. Um, the manager thought he was mad. What he didn't know is that I was doing other strange things to go and see this band at the time. We always had Wednesdays off. So I can remember one particular night, I went to see them quite a few places around, um, but one particular night they were playing in Bourges and I thought I would go. Where's Bourges? I hear some of you ask. Bourges is in the south central part of France and they were playing on the, the Wednesday night and I wanted to go to see them. And I worked out that after training Tuesday, we trained Heathrow, I could get to the airport, jump on a plane, get over to Paris, get a train down from Paris, stay overnight, go to see the gig the next day, get up in the morning, crack a dawn, get back over to Paris, up to Paris on the first train, fly over, get into Heathrow and probably just make it in time for training. I did. I made it with five minutes to spare. Went to see the gig. It was absolutely fantastic. And nobody, until this moment, was any the wiser. I was devastated when I left Chelsea. I'd been there five years and I wanted to stay. But I didn't go for the new contract. So, uh, I was also up to sign for Paris Saint-Germain. The last moment I got a phone call, I was lying on a beach in Corfu with a bunch of drunken Australians. I honestly was sober. And that Everton wanted to sign me. So my flat and mate had taken the phone call and I said to him, look, just tell the Everton manager, it's okay, I'll sign, don't worry about it. So it was probably a week or two later before I deigned to come home and fly back. And when I got back, waiting at the airport was the Everton manager. Uh, he was there, it was Colin Harvey, and the assistant manager, Terry Daricott, picked me up, sat in the back seat of the car. And as I was sitting there, the first tune that came on the radio was the Jesus Mary Chamber. And I thought, wow, that's unusual to get that on the radio. I happily nod my head to it. And then the next tune came on, and that one was new order, and I'm thinking, oh, that's a no surprise, you don't get these print bands I like on the radio so often. By the fourth or fifth song, I've realised something big I miss here. This is not right at all, because every one of my favourite bands is coming on this, and I've thought, nah, I'm not buying it. I said to the uh, Colin Hart, I said, what's going on here? And he owned up to the fact that it was his daughter who'd made a mixtape. She'd gone through all my interviews and found out the bands I'd want, found seen interviews that I'd done, the NME, etc., and made a mixtape uh, so as to make me, me sign. Now Colin admitted that he didn't like any of the music at all, he thought it was absolutely awful. And he said to his daughter, are you sure this is going to work? We could blow this completely, this sounds awful. And she said, trust me, it absolutely will work. Well, it did work, um, and I did sign. Without the music, I probably would have signed, but it, it made it that wee bit easier. And also, I was hugely impressed with that amount of organised, planning that went into it and I thought to myself if he can plan it down to the last disc and the last CD or the last tape as it was then I'll tell you what he might be able to organise a team so I signed for him. I'm proud to say that John Peel was in the end a friend of mine. When I came down to London at first um, as a boy from not exactly the sticks I come from Glasgow there was two people I wanted to meet that's all you come to smoke you want to meet two people um, one of them was John who was my hero all my young life um, Others were sitting up trying to watch matches of the day, whatever. I was under the bed clothes with the headphones on listening to the people show um, for, you know, all my teenage years. And A, I wanted to meet him. Um, and B, I eventually did. And I, I met him through a Chelsea newspaper, the Chelsea FC newspaper. I used to write a column for it. And I thought, I'm going to chance my arm here. I wrote to him and I said, look, I write for a newspaper in, uh, South West, in West London. Um, I'd like to interview you. And I got a nice letter back saying, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm very busy. And for the first, last and only time in my entire life stroke career, I wrote a second letter back saying, look, in actual fact, I play for Chelsea and I'm playing against your team Liverpool in a few weeks. It'd be good if I could do it just now, sooner rather than later. To which he phoned me straight back and we met up and uh, did an interview and became immediately really good friends. Um, so much so that I'd, uh, when we were doing the show, I'd come in and we'd sit, I'd sit in the show. He never mentioned me by name. He always said, oh, I've got the famous footballer in tonight. To which seems odd now, people would think you'd not all know who it was, but people didn't know who it was. Um, so it, it was fantastic to get a meeting. Um, we disagreed on lots of things, um, particularly <laughs> musically, um, but I learned so much out of it. And there's a lot of bands that I, get, I said, look, listen to this, do you like this? But let's be honest, it was a thousand bands he would give me to the one that I could give him. It was his 65th birthday and uh, 
the pig, Sheila, his wife, he called her the pig. <laughs> uh, she phoned me up and she says, can you come to the birthday party? And he had a birthday party, big one every five years. And some years I could make it, some years I couldn't. This 65th, I said, yeah, I'll be there. And I hadn't looked at my diary. And uh, I thought, I'll be there. Went home, found out I had a, a charity do that day and a charity thing the next morning. And this was the way down, you know, Suffolk, miles away from where I live in Scotland. And I said to my wife, I've got to be there. I don't care if I hire a plane. I'm not that wealthy, but I need to be there. And uh, eventually I did. I got a plane down. I had a driver, took me from London to Suffolk. I, was, I got about two hours sleep and, and got back and fulfilled all the things that I had to fulfill. John was dead three weeks later. And I don't know why. I've never done anything like it in my life, before, since, after, nothing. I just had to be there. I had to see him one last time. And he was in brilliant form and he was really, really happy. And my favourite band was on playing at his birthday party. It was a magical, magical day. And it just, I've never been so happy at doing anything in my entire life. And I remember that night we talked about something which was brilliant. Uh, I'd left Chelsea and I went to Everton. My first season there, cup final. Everton against Liverpool. I'm playing for Everton, he's a Liverpool fan. So I get phone John up and said, do you, do you want some tickets then? And he said, yeah, I had two tickets for him and Sheila, come along. And my whole family have got the Everton scarves on. Um, and he turns up with his red, <laughs> white in the middle of all them. And he said something to me that stayed me. All the people ever say to you, you're a good player or whatever, he's, after the game, he said, uh, unlucky, because we get beat 3-2 after extra time. They said, you're actually quite a good footballer. Well, we've known each other for five years and you've <laughs> never seen me play. And then it made me feel really good. Because we weren't friends because I was a footballer. It's because we actually got on well. Brilliant guy, massively missed. But if you look around the, the photographs in this place here, you just see the amount of people that came through, John. Yeah, it was amazing.